Before we get too far into the sermon, guys, let me, um, I want to read you a passage of scripture that, that kind of came to me this morning. And, um, I just want to remind the church of a couple of things before we get into, into the message this morning. Okay. This is out of the book of Acts. It's the 17th chapter. And, uh, let me just read a little bit of it and, uh, give you a small take of, of what I feel like the Lord wanted me to present to the church this morning. So when Paul and his companions had passed through and they came to Thessal- Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue, and what, as was his custom, Paul went into the synagogue and on three days Sabbath, on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Messiah. He said, some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and quite a few prominent women. But other Jews were jealous, and so they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace. They formed a mob. They started a riot in the city. They rushed to Jason's house just in search of Paul and Silas in order to bring them out to the crowd. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and other believers before the city officials, shouting, these men who have caused trouble all over the world have now come here and Jason has welcomed them into his house. They are all defying Caesar's decrees, saying that there is another king, one called Jesus. When they heard this, the crowd and the city officials uh, were thrown into turmoil, and then they made Jason and the others post bond, and they let them go. And as soon as it was night, the believers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. And on there, they went to the Jewish synagogue, and, and Paul starts the same thing over and over again. I just want to remind the church today that Paul and Silas operated in a society that was not Christian. Okay, it, it was not a Christian society, and they didn't make Christian decisions concerning um, values or virtues when it came to that. They were very paganistic and extremely secular. And I know that there have been some things that have happened in our country over these last couple of weeks that have really got some Christians disheartened when it comes to how they feel our nation is going and um, some of the leadership decisions that have been made um, for, by our government. I just want to remind you of a couple of things. First of all, the song that Greg and the Praise and Worship team, the first song that they sang was a song called He Reigns. He does. He he does. It's not going to matter the decisions of governments when it all boils down to it. It it will not matter. Okay? Now, we do have to live in that society now. God tells us to pray for our leaders. Okay? But one of the things that I take from this passage of Scripture is that Paul and Silas were willing to make a stand And they were willing to speak up and be seen and noticed. And we as the church need to stick to the same type of blueprint. We we need to understand that we live in a secular society. Okay? We need to realize, too, that Jesus reigns. Okay? So go forth with the message of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay? Let your your heart be merry. All right? And... Be about the business, as Jesus said it best. I must be about my Father's business, and we should be too. Okay? So, hey, that one was free. That sermon was free. Doesn't cost you a thing. All right? That one was just free. Just thought I'd lob that one out there. I just really felt like, you know, this week, I know that I got some calls and I got some texts and stuff, and I know that there are some folks in church that are kind of disheartened. And whether you agree with the decision or or whether you don't, um, and whether you're a Christian or you just got drugged here because you lost a bet this morning, um, the idea is that, you know, for, for us as a body of believers is that Jesus reigns. He, he does. So um, that's what, um, it, it, when we look at things in that light, that one day every knee shall bow, okay, and every tongue shall confess that he is Lord, whether those people chose to believe him, about him on earth or not. Scripture says that one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So just rest in that promise and rest in that fact and we should do as much as we can to love people in grace and in mercy 
okay? And the way that Christ would love them, all right? And we need to operate in forgiveness, and we need to do as much as we can to bring people to the saving and the knowledge power of who Jesus Christ is. Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay. Again, that one was free. All right. Um, So we're in the Gospel of Mark today. We're going to be, and I know it's already been pointed out to me by some very astute uh, parishioners that we that I sent the wrong information to our printer, and it's not Mark 11, it's Mark 12. Okay? I should have asked you, how many of you read Mark 11, 41 through 44? Because there aren't that many verses in, in, uh, in Mark 11. So, uh, but it's Mark 12, 40, 41 through 44. And we're doing what? Um, we're doing a loose sermon series. And if in case you never kind of heard that terminology, let me explain it a little bit. Um, a loose sermon series, one of the things we, we figured out as a staff here at Waterbrook is that during the summer months, we get a lot of people that they're traveling, you know, kids are out of school and parents wish they were back in school, but uh, there's, there's vacation time and so they're gone. We've got people that are visiting families. We've got f- families that are coming in town, right? You never knew how many relatives you had till you moved to the beach, right? And, and so you've got, there's this there's this kind of ebb and flow that happens with church in the summertime, and sometimes people they're kind of hit and miss. Like they're they're here a couple of they're here a couple of Sundays and they're gone a couple of Sundays, and that's cool. We get it. We realize y'all got busy lives, but we're doing a sermon series called "I'm Out of Here," and and it says um, how to enjoy your summer without um, sending your faith on vacation. So. What we'll do is uh, there'll be one or two summers where we'll one or two Sundays where we'll kind of hit it, where we're going to talk about faith. And one of the things that I want to talk about today, I want to talk about a certain component of faith that keeps our faith in God alive and active, even though sometimes we may not be making it to church every single Sunday. This is a way to kind of keep our faith alive and to keep our faith kind of ongoing and kind of vital because we need that sometimes when we're kind of hitting and missing out of church for whatever reason. Okay, so you guys, are you guys in Mark? Okay, let me get this thing off of Candy Crush. That's where my little daughter had it. So it was her. I was not playing on it in worship. I promise you I wasn't. Um, All right, verse 41. Jesus sat down uh, opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowds putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, This poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They gave out of their wealth, but she out of her poverty. But in everything, all she had to live on. In order to really understand that passage of scripture, we got to go back a couple of scriptures before then, okay? So if you would... Jump back to to verse 38, and then I want to read all of it in kind of the context so we get a better feel for what Jesus is talking about right here. As he taught, Jesus said, watch out for the teachers of the law or the Pharisees. They like to walk around in flowing robes and be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and have the most important seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at banquets. Listen to what he says right here. They devour widows' homes. Okay, because um, traditional Jewish law or Jewish custom was that the temple, when a a woman lost her husband and became a widow, that was the temple that was supposed to take care of the widow, right? Or the church would take care of the widow, right? And what what the Sadducees, and the Sadducees and the Pharisees, the Sadducees were really running the temple. What the Sadducees had done at that time is they had kind of reversed it to they would browbeat these widows into giving, basically writing off their inheritances and giving it to the, the temple or giving it to the Pharisees and the Sadducees and kind of patting their pockets. It was really all done out of greed. It was all, it was done, it was done... It was done out of a prideful thing, and then the Pharisees would come and they would give large amounts of money to make it look like to others that they were giving 
more than anybody else, and they all did it out of kind of pride and arrogance. They wanted the praises of, of men. And then we have this widow that comes along that Jesus starts to talk about. And he says that she gives out of faith. And what I want to talk to you today about is, I want to talk to you about, um, there are certain components and characteristics of giving out of faith. What, What does that look like? And how can we do that so that our faith does stay, our faith in God stays active? And it stays vital and alive. Okay? What what does the widow show us in this passage of Scripture that can help us to keep our faith active? All right? Please join me as we go to the Lord in prayer. Father, this is your word, and thank you for it. I love it in the fact that it's more honest than I am. And I love it in the fact that it has such permeating truths, and they're so deep. And Lord, sometimes I really feel like that when we talk about stuff like this, especially when we talk about money, and we're going to talk about some aspects of money, but this, all of this isn't just about money. It really has to do with where our hearts are. But when we talk about stuff like that, we usually have this natural pushback to where we want to defend our actions or we want to defend our attitudes or we want to defend our mindsets. And Lord, I just pray that you would kind of, you would break through that today. Just meet us where we're at. Talk to us. uh, Reveal your truth. Confront our hearts and and any type behaviors or attitudes that we don't have that's just not, it's just not right with you. Help us be honest with ourselves. And allow your Holy Spirit room to move in our hearts. We love you. Praise you. Thank you for your word. Would you speak it? instead of me. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Okay, so one of the things that's kind of neat about this passage of Scripture, when we go back and when we look at it, is um, Jesus is talking to one group of people. He's talking to his disciples, but he's talking about two different groups of people. Or, or if you really want to get down to it a little bit deeper, he's talking about two different mindsets that we have when it comes to giving. He's talking about this one mindset um, that's the, what I, I'm going to call it the Pharisaic mindset, okay? And, and don't, don't get, you know, I'm going to throw a disclaimer out real quick. Can I? I mean, can I? Really? Okay. Okay. I'm going to say some things today. All right, and I'm going to try to make them teddy bear and fluffy for you, but it's not going to come out that way. All right, it's just not going to it's not going to work. But I'm going to try to. But there there has to be a point of this that we realize because we get defensive when we talk about money. Okay, we do. Money is a trigger thing for some people, and um, I I want you to be I, w- I want you to know that I'm sympathetic to it. But this whole sermon isn't just about money. Okay, because Remember where I'm at right here, Art, because I'm going on a bunny trail right here, okay? All right, here, I'm going down, I'm heading down a bunny trail. Some people will say this about church. They'll say, you know, I don't like that church, or I don't like that pastor, man. All he ever does is talks about money. You know, the church, all they they just want my money. Right? You ever heard that? Come on. Really? Okay. Uh, they, and they say stuff like, I wish he would preach the word, or I wish he would preach more like Jesus. Right? You ever heard that? Okay. Let me give you a little historical or a little biblical facts real quick. Jesus, out of all of his parables, 30% of his parables are about money. So if you break that down into a month of Sunday, if you break that down into Sundays, and I'm preaching like Jesus, then that means one out of every four Sundays I ought to be talking about. Right. Let me tell you something else Jesus did too. He talked about, the two things he talked about the most were money and hell. And he didn't have anything good to say about either one. Right? So, when we talk about money, sometimes we get defensive. But Jesus is talking about two different mindsets here. And the thing about that is this. Sometimes we can fall into that mindset, one of these mindsets, in a good way or a bad way. 
And the idea is that we want to promote the mindset of faith and we want to diminish the mindset of arrogance. And that's the first mindset that we see here. The Pharisees, they gave out of pride. They gave out of arrogance. And one of the turntail signs of when, you, when we give out of pride is this. You expect something for what you give. Right? Like, I'm giving you this, but I'm expecting something on the other end of it. That, and and we, can, we can get to the point where we, we can give out of arrogance sometimes, can't we? And we can give out of, we can give out of pride. And that's one of the things that Jesus points out here. Then the other mindset that Jesus talks about is the widow. And he talks about how, how do you give out of faith? And, and one of the, when we talk about this too, there, there are two truths when it comes to this passage of Scripture. And one of the truths, or, or one of the lies when we talk about this passage of Scripture that combats the two truths we're going to talk about, one of the lies is this, that when I give, I'm doing God a favor. Right, like um, I, like I give when when I um, like not and I'm not just talking about money. I'm talking about talents, or I'm talking about uh, our our time. We have sometimes we can have a mindset that like I'm I'm doing God a favor by giving by giving of my time or by giving of my ties, and and that comes out of a place of of pride and arrogance that we see in the Pharisees. The, the other lie that gets told that Jesus puts his finger on right here when it comes to giving is this one. And I want to point it out to you. It's in the 44th verse. And I, and, and I highlighted the point that that's really is, I think God wants us to talk about today. For they all put in out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, put in all that she had. The other lie that we get told when it comes to giving is, I can't really give out of my poverty. Now, I'm not, when I talk about poverty, I'm not talking about just, just not having any money. But I hear, I hear people say this stuff all the time. The reason they don't volunteer is because, well, you know, the church doesn't really need them to volunteer anyway. Or that they don't have anything that they could really give. I don't have any talents that the church could use. Or, and this is a wonderful point, I didn't even think about it, but little Miss Doris right here, she came up with the idea and she said this, um, I'm too old. Now, I didn't say that. She said that. But sometimes we think that, don't we? And, and we get told a lot that, that what I possibly could bring to the table couldn't possibly be used. They couldn't use me because they don't know my past. Or they, they couldn't possibly use me because I'm just, I, I don't have anything to give. And what the widow teaches us are some certain characteristics about Jesus says she gave out of her poverty. She gave out of her faith. What does that look like? The first characteristic to look like is this. The first truth we really have to realize is that gift, giving is an act of humility. And l let me say this right here. Sometimes I think people don't give, and I'm not just talking about money. I'm talking about their time or their resources. They don't give because they haven't gotten to a place yet where they want to humble themselves before God. Let me say it again because it's important. And I'm again, I'm not trying to browbeat you or beat you up or anything like that. I'm I'm not. But if that's where you if that's where you're at, lean into that and own it. Just own it. That sometimes we don't volunteer and we don't give of our time and we don't do these things because we just haven't gotten to a place where we want to humble ourselves before God. But giving is an ultimate act of humility. Because when you really think about it, and, and I mean, think about it, this, we can't give God anything that he doesn't have, right? 
I mean, so why does God ask us to give to begin with? I mean, we can't, we can't deliver any more money into the coffers of the kingdom of God that he couldn't already get. He owns all the cattle on all the hillsides, right? He, he, he's got more money than anybody, right? I mean, he doesn't need our money. He doesn't need our time. He doesn't need our resources. He doesn't need those things. God chooses to use those things in our life. And the reason that he does choose to use those things is because when we come to God in our poverty, when we come to God in our weaknesses, when we come to God in our shortcomings, then God's able to be glorified in the midst of those things. And it's not anything that you and I bring to the table. It's what he brings to us. Paul says it best when he says this. In my weakness, he is strong. And when we're willing to give, then God gets glorified. Y'all are going to find this hard to believe. But when I was a kid, when I was little, I was kind of hard to handle. <laughs> no, really, I was. I was kind of a handful. And I'll never forget in Sunday school, we had this little old lady that I, she like she was like 120. Um, you know, I mean, she went to me when as a kid, I just thought to her, when I looked at her, I thought, wow, she's so old, you know, I mean, I just thought, but she was so sweet. She had the patience of Job in our Sunday school class. She had nine boys. All right. And we were like nine years old and she had two little old girls who just sitting, they just sat in the corner for fear, you know, because of, and and she would say, I'll never forget what she'd say. So she said, Jesus loves y'all just the way you are. But I'm not going to let you behave like that. Right? Because she would just tell, she said, now I love you like Jesus, but you're not going to behave any old way you want to. But I'll never forget the fact that she, she was so patient. She was so loving. She was so kind. And she really probably wasn't. She wasn't gifted and the most talented person when it came to teaching. But she knew that that class needed some volunteers. And who else wanted to hang out with nine, nine nine-year-old boys? Right? I mean, not unless she had a death wish. Right? But she, so she was like, I want to give them my time wherever God can use me. And uh, the other day I ran into... Uh, well, I didn't run into him. I was talking to him on the phone. He's a, he's a buddy of mine, and he was one of the nine boys in that class, for lack of a better word. Uh, hooligans is a good word to use. I was going to use something different. You can't use it in church, though. Um, and he said, Scott, do you realize out of all nine of us, there's like two preachers and uh, some deacons, and it, but all of us are in church. And, um, and, and it was really because of the fact that she chose to give out of her poverty. You know, and here's the thing that we always talk about here at this church. When we talk about, um, when we talk about these truths that we talk about, okay? I always want to put handles on it, right? Um, and, and I always say that the, the gospel's no good to you. If you can't put handles on it, meaning if you can't apply it to your life and if you can't use it. So here's the handle, okay? Where does God have you right now? All right, where, where you would have to humble yourself in order to serve him. What does that look like for you as an individual? What's God calling you to? that you may not be qualified for necessarily right off the bat, but God wants you to do it. And, and, and it, I don't know, I don't know where that is because I don't know what the conversations is between you and God, but that's a handle that you can start to think and pray about. The second thing is this, does my giving go beyond my convenience? When it comes to faith, 
one of the things that the widow shows us here is that Jesus wasn't necessarily concerned with what people gave. He was more concerned with what they held back. And and sometimes when it comes to where God has us in our walk with Him, where does God have you right now where you may have to step out of your comfort zone in order to serve Him? Or maybe God's calling you to tithe and you can't see how you're still going to make the end of the bills at the, at the end of the month work, but God wants you to step out where it's not convenient. I'm sure if you go back and ask my Sunday school teacher, was nine boys on Sunday morning the thing that you really wanted to do? She would say, no. There's a story that, um, that Dr. Ross O'Connell tells in his book, um, An Acre of Diamonds. And um, Connell was a, he was a pastor at the turn of the century around the end of the 1800s and the 1900s. And he was a pastor um, at a pretty small church in Philadelphia. And one day he talked about the story of, um, he, he was walking outside of the church and he saw this small little African-American girl and she was sobbing um, and crying. And, and he came up to her and he said, honey, why are you crying? And he said, she said, um, they wouldn't let me in the Sunday school class because they said it was too crowded. And he said he really knew the reason why, and the reason wasn't because of what we think it is. He said, but she had holes in her clothes, her her dress was real dirty, and she her her hair was unkept. She just she was very very poor. And he said so. He took her by the hand, and he walked her to the Sunday school class and she went to the, and she just lit up and she went to the Sunday school class and he said for the next two years she constantly attended this Sunday school class and she caught him that one day the first day after the service and she said thank you she said this is just such a wonderful place I'm never gonna miss a Sunday and he said that she didn't for two years and he said one day a messenger came and got him out of his office and said, there's been a horrible tragedy. Would you come down to these public housing tenements? And he said, and there, when he got there, there was this little 10-year-old girl's body, and she was dead. And um, he said that as he talked to the parents, the parents said that when they were moving her body, that this little raggedy, cracked, ruby red purse that she had probably pilfered out of a trash dump somewhere was found on her person, and it had 57 cents in it. And with it was this handwritten note in childish handwriting that said, this is, this is money that goes to help that little church buy a bigger building for children to go to Sunday school in. He said he took that purse and that note and he said he knew exactly what he had to do. He said he walked into his pulpit and for the next four Sundays he held up that purse and he told that little girl's story and he read that note and he said that church members began to rally around this uh, this whole idea of building a larger place where they could invite more children in the community into these into these things and he said and a realtor in their congregation got wind about it and he said he found a prime piece of property that was worth uh, thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars at that time and he uh, offered it to the church but the church didn't have the funds to pay for it and so he said uh, well I'll sell it to you all for 57 cents so they bought the land and then they started to take contributions and donations from the congregation and they came up with $250,000, which doesn't seem like a lot of money now, but in 1900, I mean, that, that would be the equivalent of having millions and millions of dollars today. And they, they built this huge, they built this huge church. And if you go to Philadelphia now, or if you go on a website, look up Temple Baptist church in Philadelphia and beside it sits Temple University which was built shortly after that and in Temple University there are these hundreds of classrooms that house 
thousands of children that now attend this church of over 3,000 people. And if you go down into one of the little rooms in the basement of that church, you'll find a picture of that little girl. And under it is a picture of Dr. Conwell that tells the story of the story that I just told you. You never know what God will do with your gift of giving until you give it. And sometimes God puts us in places where he wants us to give out of our inconvenience so that he can be glorified and magnified. What will God do with your gift? You'll never know if you don't give it. Where does God have you right now where he wants you to give that's not going to be a convenient place for you where you're going to have to step out of your comfort zone in order to give? And again, listen, I'm not just talking about money. I'm talking about your time, your resources, your talents, where does God have you where you could be a vital part? And listen, I, I'm going to go further than this. It's not just about our church. It's not. It, it's. I mean, I, I want you to serve here. You know I do. I'm the pastor. But that's not. it's not just about serving here at Waterbrook either. It's about serving the kingdom of God out there. Where, where is God leading you to serve to show someone the hands and the feet of Jesus out there? Because if we haven't seen anything about, other than anything else in these last days and these weeks, the world needs Jesus out there. And where is God calling you and I to serve beyond our convenience? And the last point I'm going to make, and, and I'm going to cut it short because I know it's summertime and you guys want to get out of this air conditioning and out there into that heat. So I'm going to cut the last one short, okay? Here you go. Giving by faith requires giving beyond safety. If the widow shows us anything today, she shows us that giving by faith, God will bring us to these points and times in our life where we have to throw caution to the wind and we have to give beyond safety. We have to come out of our safety zones. We have to come out of our level of comfort zones and give. I'm, can I tell you another story? I want to tell you another story because I'm just in a storytelling mood today for some reason. Um, and if, I, I talked to my wife and I said, Lisa, have I told the congregation this story before? And she said, I don't know. I don't listen um, half the time. <laughs> and um, and I, I looked at her and I said, that's not funny. That's not, I mean, that's not funny at all. I don't want to get any laugh at Now, she said, no, I really don't know because half the time, you know, my wife's an RN, so half the time she, she works on weekends, so she's not here. So she's like, honey, I don't know if you've told it or not. So I'm going to go ahead and tell the story again, okay? And if you've heard it, just act like you haven't. All right? So, okay, Jim Cimbala in his book, um, The Power of the Promise, he tells this story about um, these missionaries in the 1920s named Dave and Seva Flood and the Ericsons. They were these two couples from Sweden, and they had a heart for the, for the African people, and they were sent to um, the Congo. And so they really felt led to go to the Congo to um, present the gospel to the Africans in this region. And when they got there, they were rebuffed by the local chief of, of this village that, that they were assigned to. And uh, he just basically said, no, you're not going to have any contact with any of the people. You're not going to have any contact with, um, with anybody in the surrounding areas. And he said, you have that hill up there that you can build on, and that's it. So they went up there and then built their mud huts. And there was this one African boy um, who was allowed to sell them chicken, chickens and eggs. And Seva uh, Flood said to herself, if I only get to talk to one African then I'm going to at least make it a point 
to try my best to introduce him to Jesus. So over the course of the next couple of weeks and the months, that's exactly what she did. And lo and behold, this uh, boy became a believer. He became to believe in Jesus Christ. And then shortly after, he came into the knowledge. And he, she taught him how to read using the Bible. And then shortly after that, all four of them came down with malaria. So the Ericsons left Africa. But David and Seva Flood decided to stay behind. Shortly after that, Seva found out that she was pregnant with a little girl. And they named her Anna. And 17 days after she had Anna, Seva died from complications due to the delivery. And David Flood at that time, he just lost it. He just snapped. He buried his wife in Africa. He took his one-month little girl back to Sweden. He gave her to the Ericsons. He denounced God Anything to do with God, and as a matter of fact, his exact words were, God has ruined my life. I want nothing to do with him. And he walked away from the ministry, and he walked away from God. If you think that's the worst part of it, it's not. Anna, who was entrusted to the Ericsons, nine months later, the Ericsons die. Both of them die in a plane crash. And Anna, once again, is left without parents. She's given to a Christian couple in South Dakota. And she grows up in South Dakota. She uh, marries a man by the name of Dewey Hurst. And I know what you're thinking right now. How in the world can he keep up with all these names? I know that's what you're thinking. So Dewey Hurst becomes the president of a Bible college outside of Tacoma, Washington. And one day, because the mail, because the U.S. post office made an errant delivery, Anna, who's been renamed Annie by her parents in South Dakota now, there's this missionary magazine that comes to their house from Sweden. And on the cover of it, is David and Seva Flood from the 1920s holding this little bitty baby. And Anna knew right then that that was her mom and her dad. And since the whole magazine was in Swedish, she didn't know how to read it. She found a professor at the university who translated it for her, and the story went something like this. After they left Africa, this little boy ends up growing up, and because he could read, and because he could, he, he was, he was educated to the point where he could read English, he became a teacher. He started a school in that village. He convinced the, the, the chief of that village to let the children come. To, uh, to school there. And there he taught them the Bible. Well, long story short, 600 children in that village come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. They go back to their homes and their parents get converted. So in the middle of the Congo, there is a village there of 6,000 Christians in the middle of, of this Congo that all go to this one huge mega church. In the middle of the Congo, in the middle of this jungle, 6,000 converts, all because of this one little boy that Seva Flood had witnessed to and taught to read. So Annie or Anna at that time, she convinces her husband... They fly back to Sweden, and through some private investigation, they find her father, who at this time is is just a bitter old man. And she takes him by the hand, and she tells him this beautiful about how this one, the, the one little chicken and an egg boy that sold them these chicken and eggs, how he had started a school and how all these kids had come to know Jesus and they had converted their parents. And there in this village now were 6,000 believers in Jesus Christ that were reaching out to the other tribes and had stopped a lot of the tribal warfare that had been going on in the Congo because this, th- there was this pocket of Christians now that believed in Jesus, believed in love, grace, and forgiveness. 
And on hearing that, he looks at her and he says, with tears running down his face, I've missed Jesus. He recommits his life to Christ. And he comes to understand a very important truth that you and I need to understand when it comes to giving. That when God's involved, no gift is too small. And if we're willing to step out of our safety, if we're willing to step out of our convenient places, if we're willing to humble ourselves before God, then God will use our gifts to glorify His name and to do things, listen, that you and I, we could have never have done with under our own power. And we could have never have done in our wildest imaginations. I'm going to close with this statement right here. A.W. Tozer, and I'm going to paraphrase his statement. He says this. He says, when we get to heaven, God won't ask us all the things that we did and gave. He'll be more concerned with what we didn't do. I don't know if that's true or not. But I, I am concerned about you and I when we talk about and when we talk ourselves out of giving, when we talk about how, what do we have to do in order to keep our faith active and ongoing? We have to give out of humility. We have to give out of convenience. We have to give beyond our safety zones. Can you imagine what eternity will look like if we just, as a church, decided to start giving beyond our safety zones just an hour of our time? What would that look like in our community? Wouldn't it be neat to get to heaven and have somebody come up to you and say, I'm here because... You chose to talk nine crazy nine-year-olds in a Sunday school class that I know you probably didn't want to be in to begin with. Our faith down here can change somebody's eternity tomorrow. Please join me as we go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you. And Lord, when we talk about giving, I know that we can sometimes get caught up in so many different things. But one of the ways that you show us that Jesus taught us through the, through the widow's story is the fact that we can't give out of our poverty. We can't give even when we don't think we can. And it comes to our time and our talents and yeah, even our money sometimes. But it goes beyond those things. It really does. It, it becomes an issue of the heart. Where are our hearts with these things? What's our attitude? My prayer is that you would show us and teach us. Where do you want us to serve? Where do you have us right now? Where it's going to take faith for us to give. Where it's going to move us beyond a place of comfort. Where it's going to move us beyond a place of convenience. But it will be about your kingdom. And it'll be about souls brought. It'll be about eternities changed. It'll be about seeing the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus magnified and lifted up. Help us to do that, I pray, in the name of Jesus. And Lord, for all those that I've entered in here today, I pray that you would give them your peace today and throughout the week in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hey, guys, have a great week.